All right. Hey, Dr. Sumner. I'm filming this yet again after making a few more edits. Um, I am still not sure about that one diagram, but um, I can get in touch with you either later tonight or tomorrow to try to figure that out. Um, hopefully the septic abdomen went well, but anyways, I'll go ahead and get started. So, uh, hi everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, my name is Samuel Burkhardt. I'm currently one of the rotating interns at the University of Pennsylvania. I did this project with Dr. Julia Sumner and Dr. Sabine Mann at the University of Cornell. Um, this project is about investigating parathyroid morphology. And so to start here, this is just a very simple diagram to illustrate the role of the parathyroid and parathyroid hormone, putting aside the relationship this hormone has with cholecalciferol and calcitonin. So normally, PTH causes stimulation of renal tubular and intestinal calcium resorption and osteoclast-mediated bone resorption. Increases in the ionized calcium levels results in a negative feedback loop to decrease parathyroid hormone secretion. When we're thinking of primary hyperparathyroidism, a hypercalcemic state is produced through the secretion of this parathyroid hormone by pathologic chief cells via either an adenoma, hyperplasia, or adenocarcinoma pathology. In this scenario, you'll have high PTH in the face of high ionized calcium, which is an inappropriate expression. Clinical signs of primary hyperparathyroidism, such as polyuria, polydipsia, lethargy, muscle weakness, and general malaise are missed by 20 to 50 percent of owners, and while useful in supporting a diagnostic, diagnosis are not pathognomonic. So then when we're thinking about how we get a diagnosis, currently in veterinary medicine, cervical ultrasound is the gold standard for diagnosis as well as surgical planning. It's also used in our other treatment options as well. Minimally invasive techniques for primary hyperparathyroidism in veterinary medicine, such as ultrasound guided ablation with radiofrequency heat application or ethanol, provide an attractive option for treatment. However, these te techniques have reported failure rates of up to 31% and 28% respectively. Alternatively, parathyroidectomy as a treatment for primary hyperparathyroidism with surgical excision has proven, proven to have an excellent cure rate of approximately 95%. The potential for metastasis with parathyroid carcinomas may make ultrasound-guided ablation less desirable than surgical resection in these cases. Regardless, all of these techniques are heavily dependent upon cervical ultrasound for planning and targeting the lesion, and previous studies have shown that cervical ultrasound may disagree with surgery on the side of a lesion in up to 16% of cases. So that leads into the objectives and hypothesis of our study. Our objective was to evaluate the agreement between ultrasound and surgical findings, as they are often inconsistent despite ultrasound being the gold standard for diagnosis and surgical planning in veterinary medicine. We also included the agreement with histopathology when making a diagnosis of abnormal parathyroid morphology. In addition, previous studies have sought to utilize ultrasound to establish a size range for differentiating hyperplastic parathyroid glands from pyrothyroid adenomas and carcinomas, but have failed to establish sufficiently reliable cutoff values. Therefore, we also wanted to establish an ultrasonographic cutoff value for raising our index of suspicion for malignant versus benign pathology. We hypothesize that parathyroid carcinomas are larger than parathyroid adenomas and hyperplastic parathyroid glands when measured on ultrasound. And then finally, there has been inconsistent results regarding preoperative variables that affect postoperative hypocalcemia, so we wanted to try and provide additional clarity to this debate with the results of our study. When looking at our methods, this is an ambidirectional cohort study. The electronic medical records from Cornell University were searched from June 13, 2007 to August 1, 2016 for canine patients with a diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism, and from that we found that there were 34 retrospective cases that we could use. Dogs presenting to the hospital for surgical treatment of primary hyperparathyroidism from August 2nd to 2016 to June 28th, 2019 were prospectively enrolled, resulting in 13 cases. Dogs were eligible for enrollment if they had a cervical ultrasound and a subsequent parathyroidectomy with at least one extracted gland with a histopathologic diagnosis of parathyroid adenoma, carcinoma, or hyperplasia. Extracted data included information on signalment, preoperative type and length of clinical signs, preoperative parathyroid hormone, calcium, and phosphorus con concentrations, length of documented hypercalcemia, and whether any preoperative medications was administered for calceresis. All dogs had confirmed diagnosis and resolution of their hypercalcemia after parathyroidectomy. Complete agreement between ultrasound and surgery was defined as agreement between both the side and number of the affected glands. When all tissue removed at the time of surgery, that was thought to be pathologic by the operating surgeon, was classified as parathyroid adenoma, adenocarcinoma, or hyperplasia on histopathology, agreement between surgery and histopathology was met. And then finally, we also set parameters for, 
to defining subclinical and clinical hypocalcemia. Subclinical hypocalcemia was defined as a calcium concentration of ionized calcium less than 1.18 or total calcium less than 9.4 by the Animal Health Diagnostic Center and Clinical Pathology Laboratory at Cornell University. In addition to that, they would also have no clinical signs attributed to their hypocalcemia. And then clinical hypocalcemia was defined as an ionized calcium or total calcium concentration below the lower physiologic range and associated clinical signs requiring treatment. These signs of clinical hypocalcemia included tremors, weakness, pruritus, and seizures. And then postoperative treatment with vitamin D and or calcium supplementation was recorded along with the lowest serum calcium concentrations achieved. To assess the effect of calcitriol and or calcium su supplementation on the development of clinical or subclinical hypocalcemia, and they were considered to have received prophylactic treatment if supplementation occurred before the event, which was development of sub subclinical or clinical hypocalcemia, and not treated if supplementation occurred after the development of the event. So agreement statistics between the categorical variables recorded for ultrasound, surgery, and histopathology outcomes, side number, and location were performed using Cohen's Kappa statistic. Univariable screening was performed to explore associations between the outcome, subclinical, or clinical hypocalcemia and all exposure variables of interest. Variables with a p-value of less than 0.2 were offered to multivariable logistic regression with backward stepwise elimination. To remove the effect of treatment, separate models were built for the outcomes of subclinical hypocalcemia, including all dogs, subclinical hypocalcemia, including only that did not receive any prophylactic medication, and dogs that developed clinical hypocalcemia. Significance was set at a p-value of less than 0.05. And then finally, a nominal logistic regression analysis was used to generate a receiver operating characteristic curve to determine the best size cutoff to differentiate carcinomas from adenomas and hyperplasia. So ultrasound and surgery agreed on the number and side of glands affected in 30 out of 47, or 63.8 percent of cases. Histopathology and surgery agreed on the number of glands affected in 37 out of 47 cases, or 78.7 percent, and then a complete agreement only occurred in 26 out of 47, or 55.3 percent of cases, where the number and laterality of affected parathyroid glands were consistent between ultrasound, surgery, and histopathology. And then in addition to that, in 11 out of 47 cases, or 23%, at least some of the tissue removed at surgery that was thought to be pathologic was not consistent with the cause for primary hyperparathyroidism and histopathology. In these cases, there was a range of diagnoses, including but not limited to thyroid cyst, thyroglossal cysts, diffuse thyroid C-cell hyperplasia, ultimobrachial cyst, parafollicular cyst hyper cell hyperplasia. And then in terms of results, we're establishing cutoff values for distinguishing between a benign or malignant pathology. Receiver, receiver operating curve showed a high area under the curve of 0.82, at which 5 out of 7, or 71.4% of carcinomas, and 39 out of 44, or 88.6% of adenomas, or hyperplasia, were correctly identified based on size alone. And then finally, when assessing preoperative variables that could affect the likelihood of postoperative hypocalcemia, we found that there was a significant positive association with having a preoperative ionized calcium greater than or equal to 1.75 and developing a postoperative hypocalcemia with a p-value of 0.04. In addition, prophylactic supplementation with calcitriol or calcium was not associated with the development of postoperative hypocalcemia with a p-value of 0.99. We could not find in this study any association with postoperative hypocalcemia and other, any other variables, including the chronicity of clinical signs preoperatively, the size of the affected glands, the number of affected glands, or prevailing histopathology diagnosis. We also found, um, perhaps somewhat shockingly, that 22 out of 47, or 46.8% of cases, became subclinically hypocalcemic at a medium of 48 hours, and that 8 out of 47, or 17%, became clinically hypocalcemic at a medium of 5 days. This was a lot longer than we were expecting and was several more days um, than what has previously been reported. So when discussing the agreement um, between ultrasound, surgery, and histopathology, there was a fair agreement between ultrasound and surgery regarding the identity of the parathyroid pathology. We do recognize that there is a discrepancy in the number of glands deemed affected being influenced by the improbability of the surgeon removing and hence submitting for histopathology all four parathyroid glands. However, the contraindication and location of pathology is still important. 
Our findings are consistent with previous reports that have described discrepancies between the sign of the lesion on ultrasound and at surgery at approximately 19%. This inconsistency in identifying parathyroid pathology in ultrasound examination may explain the previous reports of inferior cure rates of ultrasound-guided parathyroid gland ablation when compared to surgery, which would be 70% versus 95% respectively. In addition, this finding provides continued support for bilateral exploration during parathyroidectomy as the current gold standard for treatment of primary hyperparathyroidism. And yet, even though cervical exploration is more successful at identifying parathyroid pathology than ultrasound, 23% of all dogs that went to surgery for a primary hyperparathyroidism had at least some tissue removed that was not pathologic. This overestimation and inability to correctly identify pathologic parathyroid glands does not seem to affect the success rates of parathyroidectomy in the treatment of primary hyperparathyroidism. However, this may prove to be a limitation in the development of minimally invasive techniques. In contrast, the trend towards minimally invasive surgery in humans has necessi necessitated the use of more accurate diagnostic techniques. These include nuclear medicine scintigraphy and four-dimensional CT in concert with intraoperative parathyroid hormone monitoring to minimize unnecessary surgical resection. And while all this sounds great, further research is warranted to determine if a similar diagnostic approach could improve the identification and removal of pathologic parathyroid tissue in veterinary medicine while remaining cost-effective, cost which is unfortunately something that we really need to be mindful of as veterinarians when treating our patients. And then in terms of a cutoff, we were able to establish a reliable cutoff value of greater than or equal to 8 millimeters as measured by ultrasound as suggestive of a parathyroid carcinoma. Although caution really needs to be exercised in using side as sole criteria for diagnosing carcinomas, the identification of a large parathyroid mass may guide a timeline for surgery given the theoretical risk of metastasis or invasion of such a more malignant or aggressive parathyroid malignancy. And then also discussing the, the post-operative hypocalcemia and variables that could potentially affect it. This study found an association with a preoperative ionized calcium greater than or equal to 1.75 and the development of post-operative clinical hypocalcemia. While our findings do not endorse a strict cutoff, they do potentially support more vigilant monitoring for post-operative hypocalcemia in dogs with this high preoperative ionized calcium levels. Dogs with ionized calcium levels greater than 1.75 prior to surgery should be closely monitored postoperatively considering their increased risk of developing hypocalcemia. In agreement with our findings, a study by Feldman and others had found that dogs with a total calcium level greater than 14 preoperatively, which is roughly equivalent to our ionized calcium finding, were at a higher risk of developing postoperative hypocalcemia. And perhaps more shockingly, no other associations were found with postoperative hypocalcemia, including the length of preoperative hypercalcemia and the administration of prophylactic calcium supplementation and or calcitriol. Removal of these prophylactic treatments for hypocalcemia, which don't appear to be associated with postoperative hypocalcemia, would eliminate the suppression of the non-pathologic parathyroid glands and potentially reduce client expense. There was some level of subjective variability in the assessment of the parathyroids, as there were several different board radiologists, surgeons, and pathologists who participated in the ultrasonography, surgery, and histopathology of the cases. There was inherent case selection bias as 33 cases in this study were examined retrospectively. In addition, we will never know the real truth of ultrasound pathology, but rather only what the surgeon saw as pathologic and was subsequently submitted to histopathology. All dogs did have resolution of their hypercalcemia postoperatively, so one would have to assume that the pathologic tissue was removed by the surgeon. And then finally, the number of cases included in this study was small, which is reflective of the low incidence of primary hyperparathyroidism. So in conclusion, our main findings of the study is that a preoperative ionized calcium greater than or equal to 1.75 is a significant variable associated with postoperative hypocalcemia in dogs undergoing surgical treatment for primary hyperparathyroidism. These dogs really should be closely monitored postoperatively considering their increased risk of developing clinical hypocalcemia. And then it's important that clinicians remain mindful that this clinical hypocalcemia did not develop until a medium of five days postoperatively. We didn't find any other variables that influenced the development of postoperative hypocalcemia, including the prophylactic treatment and, and the length of preoperative hypocalcemia. And then we also found that parathyroid carcinomas are more likely to measure greater than or equal to 8 millimeters on ultrasound. And considering the malignancy of this pathology, the authors would, you know, we would encourage their surgical removal. However, would also caution that we should not use size as the only basis for determining this. 
Ultrasound is only a moderately reliable tool in evaluating parathyroid pathology, indicating the importance of bilateral parathyroid exploration in dogs with primary hyperparathyroidism. And then prospective studies, as opposed to ambidirectional cohort studies that are multi-institutional to allow for a larger case selection, are encouraged to further investigate ways to increase the efficacy of parathyroidectomies, as well as identify variables that could influence postoperative hypocalcemia. Here's some of my selected references. Thank you so much for listening, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. My email is sjburke at vet.upin.edu. I'd be happy to hear from any of you. Thank you.